Good afternoon to you all. I'm here today to um, talk to you about a very important topic, very close to my heart. That is about how all of us can redefine the way how we eat food and what kind of food we eat. And how we can all take charge about making this change, whether it's you, you, maybe you. Um, I've been spending the last few years interacting with food entrepreneurs around the world, in Asia, in Europe, and in the US. And the one important thought I wanted to share with you tonight is entrepreneurs increasingly are taking upon themselves to enter the area of food in the same way that tech entrepreneurs have reinvented the way we think about technology. I actually have coined this word kitchen entrepreneurs. It used to be garage entrepreneurs of technology. Today I'm going to talk to you about the kitchen entrepreneurs. Let me start with a little bit of statistics. In the past, 10 years ago, food innovation, that is new product, was very much the preserve of large multinationals. They were churning out new product. What happened over the last 10 years, the same multinationals have been more concerned with taking out millions of dollars of the cost base or adding ingredients to your back label, rather than truly innovating. Today, SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprise entrepreneurs, account 72% of all new products being launched in Europe and in the US. How did that happen? Well, number one, some new capital came in. People like myself have been investing behind the right entrepreneurs. Number two, distribution. That is how you take a product to market, how you commercialize a product to market, has become more independent. Number three, technology has become more ubiquitous, more available for this entrepreneur. And number four, the, more, some of them have left the world of high tech to get into food. And the game is open. Now, you will see increasingly in my daily life, lots of entrepreneurs getting into the field. Now, how do they innovate? They do it into three ways. One is, they're using technology as a way to reinvent existing categories that we're all familiar with, as well as coming up with new categories. Two, they try to personalize their experience. They try to make it relevant to their daily life. And three, they are what I'm calling humanizing it. For too many years, we've been accustomed to very standardized product, very standardized supermarket. And what entrepreneurs have managed to do is they brought back the human touch to buying and consuming food. Let me start with the first aspect, which is innovation. Imagine yourself six years ago. We're down in Brazil, in Rio, two entrepreneurs, Mike and Ira, are there sitting at a bar. They're checking up, checking up a couple of girls, and they ask the girls the questions, what's your favorite drink? And the two girls answer, coconut water. Two American guys come back to the US, launch what is today a $200 million company. Amazing, right? All they did is actually extract water from coconuts turn it into what people call a septic tetra pack technology and made it available to the masses. Today, the product is available all around the world. They managed to convince millions of consumers out there that their dream could come true. Why? Because coconut water happens to be in nature and it's always been part of nature. It just happened to be very low in calorie, very low in sweetness, and more importantly, this is natural electrolyte. This is the power, the fuel that can get you going, that get you refreshed. And these two guys made it. Another great example of innovation is HPP, shorthand for high pressure pasteurization. What it is, it's basically applying lots of pressure into juices. Normally, juices that you normally consume it on a day to day basis are heated. They heat it up to 74 degrees. You may imagine what 74 degrees Celsius does to a fruit, it takes away all the good stuff. Instead, high-pressure pasteurization applies pressure, keep the nutrients strong and valid. I've met at least three entrepreneurs who work up one day and say, hey, let's use this technology to apply the juice juices, and they launch businesses in the US and in Europe. Here's a great example, OJ, orange juice, right? Something that you all drink on a regular basis. The ones you drink has about 100% of the recommended daily allowance in it. The HPP technology that some of these entrepreneurs use it, double this amount. So it brings the nutrients back to where they belong, to Mother Nature. 
The third one, which I really like, is the one for chips. Uh, we're all consuming chips. Um, and I met uh, a, year, a couple of years ago, a couple of entrepreneurs from San Francisco. They came to me and they say, hey, we love chips. We love to munch chips in front of TV. But we are health conscious. We're really concerned about our health and what we put into our body. So they bought a plant that was doing popcorn. And they tried to tweak the technology a little bit to do pop potatoes. What it is are potatoes that taste yummy, but delivers 70% less fat than the regular potato chips. That, if you ask me, is the holy grail of food processing for us. Great food, yummy, but one that delivers health. Health and yummy in the past have not been very good uh, brothers and sisters. The second area where entrepreneurs have ventured into is the field of personalization. This is a great example. Edward, and just imagine maybe the picture. He's, uh, he's sitting in Israel in Silicon Wadi, which is the way people call Silicon Valley in Israel. And he's talking to a number of engineers. Those are system and carbonation engineers. And the challenge is very simple, is how do I take a bottling plant, which is worth billions of dollars, huge plant where your Coca-Cola and Pepsi are being produced, how do I turn it into a small machine that you can have at home and you can customize to your taste? Well, he did it after six years of hard work. And what we have today is a small machine that sits on your kitchen tabletop. You have capsules, very much like Nespresso, that allows you to have about 80 different drinks that you can consume at home. You can pick from the drinks. You can even go on, on the internet and say, hey, what about having a cola with lychee? So it's the power back to the user and the power of technology to support that empowerment. Another great example of customization or personalization is an online site in Germany called MyMuesli. Complex picture. Around the circle, you have about 80 different ingredients. Nuts, fruits, uh, cereals. And the different lines crossing the circles are individual choices that the consumers have made by picking their own muesli, assembling ingredients. Now, for some reason, the German seems to like a combination of strawberry and, uh, and oat. Uh, up to you to define what's, what's really your, your choice. Uh, really interesting case study about how technology is serving the needs of a consumer to pick what they really want, as opposed to what's being served to them in a supermarket. The third area which I found really interesting as a driver of innovation is the one of personalization. We've been talking a lot about understanding where food comes from. Well, you've got a number of entrepreneurs that got into that field and are now providing the technology to provide you the means to understand where the food comes from. So here's an orange. And today, with your smartphone, you're in a position to understand where the orange comes from where it was grown, where it was shipped, and where it was distributed. Giving you the power to understand whether you're happy to consume that orange. There's another great example I picked up uh, a week ago. Coming from the fish, really difficult supply chain to understand, because remember, a fish, a fish comes from a number of different fishing boats. Really hard to trace how this fish starts from a fishing boat, take it to a distributor, to a retailer, and then to you as a consumer. Well, they managed to do it. And I'm a firm believer that whoever cracks that traceability issue will be rewarded by consumers that will be really, really loyal to that product. Here's an example of humanization. I mean, I've always believed that food should be about humans. Uh, and again, uh, I'm, I'm always sorry to hear when people are talking about standards. I think we should talk about humans when it comes to food. Imagine yourself in Holland. This is uh, a Dutch supermarket. You enter the Dutch supermarket, and in front of you, you've got this young entrepreneur called Kuren Bolle. He's coming from Ahol, which is one of the biggest Dutch supermarkets next door to us. He decided to leave his day job to create his, his own supermarket. What it is, it's called Markt. You enter the supermarket. What happens is you immediately struck by how friendly the staff is. You invariably have an opportunity to interact with the farmers, the producers. So you go to the cheese sections, and here's the cheese farmers that talks to you about how he makes cheese. 
Then you go to the fish section. Very interesting. You go to board that tells you the name of the fishing boat, the name of the fisherman that actually caught the salmon or the cod you're about to buy. And what he's managed to do is create an environment where profit is being shared in a very fair manner between the producer, the retailer, and the consumers. By the way, he's just opened his eighth store in Amsterdam in a very successful manner, and he's got his eyesight and opened another 10 around Europe. Another interesting example of humanization comes from Germany. This is an entrepreneur that decided that he was tired with figuring out what recipe to cook. You know, what should I cook tonight? That's the ultimate questions we all have when we are off work. Well, he came up with a pretty simple idea, and it's not technology-based, right? It's just common sense. It's just putting on a table the ingredients which are required to cook a recipe. Very simple. Hard to execute, though, because you need to figure out what recipe will work, to whom, by when. He's got about 10 stores in Germany, and he's about to open another 20. Now, obvious, obvious benefit of that model is it saves you time, it saves you waste, so you don't have to waste from the product that you buy from the supermarket, and it also allows you to control budget so that you actually can buy here 7, seven euros 80, a perfect meal that you have to cook for tonight. So these, as you can see, are sometimes technology-based, sometimes they're not technology-based example of how entrepreneurs have all of a sudden waking up and say, hold on, I don't like the way I either buy my food or I eat my food. What I've tried to demonstrate to you today is that the power to reinvent the food is in our hands. You don't need a PhD in food science to do so. None of these entrepreneurs had a food science degree. What they did, though, they analyzed the market. They analyzed how food was being consumed, and they took into their own hands to raise the capital, put together the team to actually make it happen, in very similar fashion that the tech entrepreneurs have done it in the past. So, first lessons for me, at least, is be creative with technology. Don't get a PhD. Second is personalize and you know, understand what it is that people need and give them the choice back. We've lost the choice, now is the time to reclaim it. And third is make sure the shopping experience is as fun and unique as it should be. Don't let the supermarket tell you what to do. Create your own shopping experience. There's the ugly word of merchandising. Those of you who know what it is, it's, it's concept of actually putting the right product in the right place in the supermarket. And very often it's driven by profit per square meters or sales per square meters. Well, I like to put to you that the supermarket of the future may be online, but when it's not online, it's actually taking into consideration the consumer needs and responding to it. So I thought I've given you a glimpse of the sort of example out there of successful food entrepreneurs. Now, my last thought to you is, when you leave this room, is figure it out, go for it. But more importantly, if you're to come up with a food concept, keep it tasty and really, really nutritious. Thank you.